Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 371st episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. I have said it many times, I am a lifelong learner, and I'm excited to let you know about a unique global online event made just for those of us who want to grow our own food. In this four-day online learning opportunity, a collection of visionary growers, gardeners, permaculturists, and homesteaders share garden hacks, slow tools, gadgets, and gardening technologies. Join tens of thousands of budding growers and learn how to save time, energy, and money while doing what you love most, growing your own food and medicine. Visit urbanfarm.org forward slash garden hacked to register for this free online summit. Today on our podcast, we have someone who documented the first town-wide pesticide-free ordinance in the world. We're talking with Philip Ackerman Leist about the pesticide-free community. Philip is Professor of Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems at Green Mountain College in Vermont, where he established the college's organic farm, sustainable agriculture curricula, and the first online graduate program in sustainable food systems in the United States. He and his wife, Erin, live on a remote off-grid farm in Paulette, Vermont, with their three children, where they raise grass-fed American milking devons cattle. He is the author of Rebuilding the Food Shed, How to Create Local, Sustainable, and Secure Food Systems, and Up Tunket Road, The Education of a Modern Homesteader. His newest book, A Precautionary Tale, How One Small Town Banned Pesticides, Preserved Its Food Heritage, and Inspired a Movement, is published by our friends at Chelsea Green Publishing. Welcome to the show today, Philip. Are you ready to rock a pesticide-free community? Yeah, or at least that's the way they'd say it there. So yes, absolutely. Glad to be here, Greg. Excellent. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Sure. Well, I was originally born in North Carolina and always had an interest in agriculture. My grandfather was a plant pathologist there at North Carolina State University and had a peach orchard and his thing was peaches and he developed over a dozen varieties of peaches that are still grown throughout the southeast. And as it turns out, also developed a lot of the pesticide spray programs that also were there in the southeast for peaches and then also for grapes and strawberries. My introduction to farming was what you find very much throughout North Carolina, but then in 1983, ended up as a college student in the Italian Alps at a place called Brunenberg Castle, an agricultural museum. And there I really found the kind of farming that I fell in love with, which was on the steep slopes, diversified, you know, deep food traditions and people with a lot of wisdom about agriculture and, you know, who really understood sustainability in a very deeply rooted way as they'd been there for 30, 35 generations. Wow. Yeah, it was just an incredible place to be. And I keep going back ever since 1983 and actually worked and farmed there for about four years. And as part of that, for three of those years, I was spraying pesticides because that was what we had to do in the vineyard, at least what we thought we had to do. (laughs) It was what we knew. And, you know, it was a pretty interesting experience and foray into pesticides on the other side of the big pond there. So that's been a place that's been near and dear to me. But I was ready to leave the world of pesticides as much as I could. So I came to Vermont, which is the perfect place to try and do that, and was fortunate to be able to begin a college organic garden here at Green Mountain College and then build out the sustainable ag curriculum and the graduate programs and really try to find the solutions that I wasn't finding while I was out there with the spray wand. Now we've got the magic organic wand and trying to figure that one out. (laughs) Right. Nice. So your book, A Precautionary Tale, is about a town. Tell us about the town and how did you hear about it? Yeah, you know, it's a total irony and and sort of this funny thing. I'd say I was happy to get away from the idea of pesticides. And this place that I keep going back to, the South Tyrol region of the Alps, where Brunenberg Castle is, one of the places that I would always go to to get away from, you know, the orchards and the vineyards that were surrounding the castle there, I was up in the upper Finchgau Valley, which is at the point where Italy, Austria, and 
and Switzerland all come together. And, you know, it was a really incredible place that still had that diversified, smaller scale, sometimes mid-scale agriculture. And, you know, a place without a lot of, at that point in time, fruit trees and a lot of vineyards. And, you know, it was still relatively pristine in terms of not having any synthetic pesticides that were really used there. So I was taking a group of graduate students back in 2014 for a study tour there, you know, where we were looking at what we call turning traditions into markets. And so looking at how the people there had turned these food traditions into new economic opportunities for farmers and bakers and distillers and others. And we stumbled upon the story of Maltz, as it's known. It's the town of Maltz or Malas Venosta in Italian. We heard that they were having a, well, I was going to say rebellion. It was a bit of a rebellion, but a referendum to ban all synthetic pesticides in their town, which was extraordinary. I've never heard of anything like it anywhere in the world. And it was certainly not something that was going to happen in this region where pesticides were part and parcel of daily agricultural life. Right. So just sheer coincidence. Wow. So this was 2014. What is the timeline on this book? Yeah. So in 2014, they had the referendum and they'd spent about two years in having the conversations that got them up to that point. And so the referendum was there, which meant that the town council had to take it up and turn this concept into ordinances. The ordinances were finalized in March of 2016. And actually, they just went into place April 1st of this year. You know, we hammered pretty hard on the book project and the multimedia project that I was working on with Douglas Gayton of the Lexicon of Sustainability. We've been at it a little more than three years in tracking the story and trying to put it together and share it with the rest of the world because it's such an amazing, inspiring story of what these grassroots activists did without ever expecting certainly to be in the international spotlight, but not even being sure of their own ability to succeed and what they were trying to do that they're in their small town. Right. So what issues collided to create this? Yeah, that's a, a great question and kind of a co-conspiracy of sorts. Climate change was one piece because suddenly, you know, with climate change over the last two, three decades, the apple farmers have been able to move into territory that they could never grow apples in before. So they were moving further and further up the valley and Maltz, the town, is at the upper end of the valley. And so Maltz could see it coming from down below. They could see the lower part of the valley taken over completely by apple monocultures, much as we see, you know, corn and soy in parts of this country. And then then in the middle of the valley, they saw it coming, and so they decided to take a stand before it actually arrived in full force in their town. So climate change was one piece. You know, it is a bit of a story about land grabbing, because apple farmers there are just making extraordinary net profits on a hectare, which is two and a half hectares, netting between 25,000, 40, and even 45,000 euros, and a euro equivalent to a dollar or more. Right. And making just incredible profits. So climate change and then also, you know, what some of the folks there really call land grabbing. And those were the things that set the stage for this story. Wow. So what is the process that they went through to make this happen? Yeah. Well, and that's why I got to write a book about it because you know, they, they did so many amazing things just in the course of a couple of years in trying to set the stage. And they began as they saw what was coming and they saw what was happening down in the lower regions of the valley in which they live, you know, they realized that they needed to create a collective vision for themselves of what it was that they wanted and what they wanted to hold on to and what they wanted in the future. And everyone agreed that the two things they didn't want, I shouldn't say everyone, but about three quarters of the population seemed to be lining up with the notion that they didn't want synthetic pesticides coming in and threatening the organic agriculture that was happening there and the grain renaissance. That was one piece that was very important for them. And they also didn't want the monoculture and all the infrastructure that went with the monoculture. They wanted to retain these food traditions that have been documented now for you know more than 5,000 years because this is an area in which the ice man was found, you know, who's dated back to 5,300 years old. And actually, you know, the grains that he was consuming and a lot of the foods that he was consuming at the time that they found out were still things that were being produced and consumed there in the valley in the town of Maltz. Wow. Yeah, it's just astounding. Yeah, and what role did the townswomen play in this whole process? Well, you know, the men were good at getting people together and talking, but they seemed to fail in <laughs> getting the politicians and the media to pay attention. And so, you know, it was really once the women stepped into the picture,
picture and they were frustrated that the politicians weren't listening and the media wasn't helping to share the story, they did a couple of things. One was they came together and they wrote a series of letters to the editor and got all of them published in the local paper there all at one time. And those called for the mayor to step in and do whatever was necessary to protect the health of the human citizens and the environment there, which actually in Italy and in the EU, a mayor has the right to actually do that, to supersede any of the other laws or typically what a mayor would do in order to protect the health of his or her community. You know, one of the next things they did was they turned bed sheets into banners. And so it's a tourist town. So lots of bed sheets that are there to be had. Uh-huh. And they had a stenciling campaign. And what they were trying to set up was a summer night in which everyone would have these banners that would suddenly appear you know, throughout the town of Maltz, which is actually 95 square miles. And it's 11 villages that are combined in a municipality. And so the idea was everyone would wake up at sunrise and there would be these banners that were displayed calling for a pesticide-free future. And that was a key moment because as they were making the banners, there was a beekeeper whose name is Pia Oswald. And Pia said, you know, as we're making these banners, and we're pushing this campaign forward, it has to be a positive campaign. And so we should not use the words no, not, never, or ban. We need to call for a pesticide-free future because almost everybody can get behind that. And that was brilliant. That really was a linchpin in the whole progress of the initiative at that point. Wow. I'm a longtime believer in being for something and against nothing. I feel like we can make more progress if we're looking for the positive, happy, and for. Exactly. And when we can do that collectively, all the better. Yeah. And how is Malls becoming a beacon internationally? It's pretty extraordinary. You know, as I said, that wasn't what they were gunning for, you know, certainly, and it wasn't even in their imaginations. But as it turns out now, you know, it's a model throughout Europe, which is being touted as an example of what a town can do through direct democracy and the utilization of the precautionary principle. And so, in fact, I'll be going back over in, to Brussels at the beginning of June, where the EU Social and Environment Commission is taking testimony on on different pesticide-free initiatives around Europe, including malts, where we'll have our pop-up show that tells the story of malts there and the book and other things as well. And so Europe has clearly recognized malts as a model. And then also in India, Vandana Shiva, who wrote the foreword for the book and did a wonderful job with that, she's been a longtime supporter of malts from the early stages of the movement. And she invited Ulrich Veit, uh, the mayor, and myself to come over to India. She wanted Uli, as he's known around town, the mayor. She was set up a ceremony for him and the minister of Sikkim in India, the state of Sikkim, and for them actually to light candles together to unify the pesticide-free movements around the world. And that was really, really powerful. And when we left and and parted ways, Uli said, of all the things that have happened, this is the most powerful to be recognized in this way. And, And also to feel a spiritual force because it's not been an easy battle, you know, that they've taken on here. It's had its personal tolls as well. Oh, I'm sure. Wow. I have to tell you, so far, this conversation has moved me several times. I feel so fortunate to be able to help share the story. And there are other places around the globe where this is happening in different forms. And so what I hope is we can all find ways to raise up these stories and these people and grassroots citizens who are just doing amazing things. And sometimes it just starts with one parent, as it did in Irvine, California. Right. There was one mother who transformed what happened there in terms of a pesticide-free community. Yeah, well, thank you so much for documenting this process. It's cool. It's just a privilege to do it. So you mentioned precautionary principle. Tell us what that is, because I'm sure that most people don't know what that is. Oh, you're right. And it's unfortunate. And it's not a fault of any of your listeners or or many of us. You know, it's sort of a failure, I think, of the U.S. educational system and also our health and environmental protection system as well. So the precautionary principle is utilized by the U.N., by most industrialized countries around the world, by various organizations. I think the state of California actually does utilize it to some degree. But the precautionary principle is this question of burden of proof. So where should the burden of proof be? Should manufacturers who manufacture substances, which you know are questionable in terms of their safety, should they be charged with demonstrating proving their safety? Or should citizens be the ones who have to bear that burden of proof in order to prove the danger? And so the precautionary principle puts forward the notion that the burden of proof should lie upon the manufacturers to prove the safety. And instead, we operate you know, under the reverse in many right. cases in the United States. Yeah. 
And so how did the town of Malls use this to develop their ordinance? Yeah, it was a really critical piece in developing. They first, very savvily, the town pharmacist and the town pediatrician came together. So Johannes Unterpertinger and Elizabeth Fiertler came together and they wrote a manifesto. And in that manifesto, which was calling at that point for a, essentially a pesticide-free future, they embraced the precautionary principle and said, essentially, you know, with the spraying of all these synthetic pesticides, we don't know what all the dangers are and we find them unexpected acceptable and they're unneeded because we have this incredibly clean environment, which is a great place for the tourism here in the area. And they got virtually, I think it was everyone but three people in the region there, all the doctors, dentists, veterinarians, environmental scientists, wildlife biologists, everybody who had a doctorate in the sciences of health signed on to the manifesto. And that was a huge, extraordinary move because suddenly people had confidence that, you know, science was on the side of the call for a pesticide-free movement. Right. Is that chapter 11 in your book called Manifesto? Yes, absolutely. Perfect. And is this principle being utilized in the United States? I think you mentioned California. California has used it some. It's been pushed kind of from, you know, the fringes, unfortunately, of society, you know, in many ways. So there are different environmental and health organizations that are trying to push it forward. But I think we need to be more aggressive in that regard. And, you know, first, we need to make sure that there's a basic literacy about the precautionary principle and that people understand how it can be used and why it should be used. And then we need to to find ways to infuse that into our democratic processes, which you know, I'm afraid we've mostly failed in that regard so far. <laughs> you think? <laughs> yeah. So what is Topping Goliath? Yeah, so this project that I've been working on, I think, you know, things always go better when you've got great collaborators. Oh, that is the case. You know, things are much more powerful and you get more expertise and more talent. So after finding out about this story, I invited Douglas Gayton to come along and check out the story with me and my students and to see if he thought that it was a story he'd be interested in documenting because with his work with the lexicon of sustainability, of which he's the co-founder, they're based in California. You know, Douglas just has such a powerful storytelling skill set. After he went, he saw he was totally taken by the story and the people. And so we started working together, you know, traveling there twice together in order to document it, you know, visually. And, you know, so we did everything we could in terms of taking audio interviews, video interviews, photographs, the information artworks, creating a pop-up show, creating a website, and of course, writing the book, A Precautionary Tale. And, you know, Toppling Goliath is a name that Douglas came up with, you know, in thinking about this is a story of our time in so many ways. You know, it's about how do we find the leverage points to topple the Goliaths of our age, you know, the ones that really aren't taking into consideration the well-being of the planet or, you know, even just of the citizens gathered around us in, in small towns and small communities. Is there a website involved? There is. It's www.topplinggoliath.org and hope folks will visit it and you can see the timeline. We really wanted to dissect how this movement happened. And so there's a timeline there. There are also the magnificent information artworks and photographs that Douglas has and you can get a really good overview and then you can dive into the book and get an even more sophisticated view to the inside. Beautiful. I'm looking forward to reading the book and I know that the lexicon of sustainability does some excellent work. It's just amazing and you know I hope folks also know they've got a great project that they've worked for about two years with the USDA with the Natural Resource Conservation Service going around and Douglas was documenting organic farmers and their practices and it's probably the most most magnificent publication NRCS has ever put out. And just this idea of trying to educate people about what the possibilities are with organic agriculture. Right. When I know that Lexicon of Sustainability does a photographic art show that you can bring to your town, because we did one in an event here about a year ago here in Phoenix, where we brought in some of the posters and it was just, they were extraordinary. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So there was that show and now there's the USDA show, which is for free. You can go to the NRCS office in in your town, in your county, and you know, work out the arrangements to get the pop-up show for the organic farming communities around the country. And then we've also got the Toppling Goliath show, which I'm taking with me on the book tour to all the events, you know, so that people can really get a visual cue on what this is all about. Excellent. I have one more question before we shift, and I want you to tell me about your graduate program in sustainable agriculture. Just give me two minutes on that, would you? I know that's something that some of our listeners might be interested in taking. Yeah, I hope so. You know, I'll say from the beginning,
beginning, I was a skeptic of online education. So was I. So was I big time. <laughs> yeah, I lived without power and running water for almost eight years on our farm here, and I was sort of the ultimate Luddite. But I started watching two of our other online programs, and what I was seeing was a trend that I really liked, in that there were a number of people who were in rural areas or places where they just they couldn't break away in order to get a graduate degree. A lot of them were women. Sometimes they were disenfranchised in various ways and just you know, found it really difficult to be able to attain an affordable graduate degree. When we were looking for our next graduate program, I proposed the Master's in Sustainable Food Systems and we developed it. And it's just been an amazing thing because you've got people from all over, not just the U.S., but also we've got some in Canada, Virgin Islands, you know, Puerto Rico, and not that those aren't parts of the U.S., but off the mainland. Right. You know, so we've got people flung far afield who are coming together with all this expertise. I think we're at close to 70% women, about 20% veterans, which is really interesting. Oh, that's huge. A number of dietitians and nutritionists who are in the program. It's just really extraordinary. It becomes a network that people utilize and carry forward once they're done with the degree. That's part of the neat thing. And the capstone is a solutions-oriented capstone. So, you know, we give people a chance to make sure the rubber hits the road while they're in the program and they've got the support here to figure out solutions to their community issues or the entrepreneurship that they're trying to do on their own. Right. Well, I actually taught at Arizona State University for about five years, and that was one of the pieces that I plugged into all of my classes, is that the students actually had to go out and do something. Oh, that's fantastic. We have to break down those ivory tower walls. Yeah, <laughs> and do something with it. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that. It is so important. So I'm going to shift on you, and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you learned from it. I thought about this question at various points, and it's not because I haven't failed and fallen flat on my face at various times, Greg, but I think, you know, usually when I look back, I see more a series of different course corrections that were made in the middle of doing something, and very often, particularly in terms of looking around at the sustainable agriculture and food systems around the country and different places, as I've looked out and, and had a vision of things that I thought needed to happen, you know, I think the grand visions very often made sense, but inevitably, I, I was struggling sometimes to really see the whole picture. And I think one of the biggest examples of that for me was teaching sustainable agriculture for a number of years. My thinking stopped at the farm gate and I didn't take it really all the way to the plate. And so in 2006, we started working here at Green Mountain College on retooling our food system and working with the dining hall. And that was a real case in which I had to wake up and realize what was going on, that my views were pretty myopic in terms of understanding the food system. You know, once we started dealing with insulin, institutional food services. I found myself having to really ally myself with Dave Andrea, who is the dining hall manager here, to see the inside of Dave's world of what it is to try to change the food system from inside. I think there are these various times and I've been a bit myopic, but it's other people and collaborating with them, I think, that has you know really kind of awakened me to the possibilities and to better paths forward. Yeah, it's the collaboration piece that is so essential, I would guess. Yes? Yes, absolutely. So what do you consider your biggest success? Probably you know, starting what was at one point a fairly lonely project of starting what I wanted to be a college farm, eventually even starting as a college garden with just me out there and making the raised beds, you know, and doing everything kind of out of pocket and, you know, just hoping that maybe the garden would inspire other people enough to take up the initiative and for the the college to embrace it. So that ended up being pretty darn successful. The first summer was one in which I was alone a lot. And then gradually one student came to help and a librarian actually started to step up and help out. And then that just really blossomed from that little quarter acre garden to a sustainable agriculture curriculum to a 23 acre organically managed farm and then into this graduate program as well. So it's 20 years of work, but it's certainly been worthwhile. Oh. And it's just incredible now to see the those seeds of that garden a long time ago really blossom into the farmers and the food entrepreneurs who a lot of them have actually decided to stay rooted here in this region. So we've been incredibly lucky. Awesome. Congratulations. That's huge. Well, thanks. There again, you know, the right people came together and the beauty of it was it was the students who ended up making it successful. I was able to plant the seeds and get things going, but once they put their shoulders behind it and they made it clear to the administration that they wanted it and that was the future of a lot of what the college was going to do, then that changed the game. Yeah. That was really the beauty of it. Awesome. Well, you know, and that's the sign of a good teacher. We're planting seeds and people are getting it and doing something with it. Yay us. 
Yeah, and they keep us young, at least in spirit. <laughs> exactly. So what drives you? That's a great question, and I think somehow it goes back to growing up in my family, you know, where I had a father who was a Presbyterian minister and very progressive, and of course my mother doing a lot of the work as well down in the South and pushing for integration and, you know, equity there. So there's something in that background of watching my parents really have, in their case, it was a call for social justice, and I think social justice drives me environmental justice does and food justice as well so just that yearning for justice and fairness you know and ecological well-being all of those pieces are i think big drivers for me nice thank you if you could recommend one book for our listeners what would it be and why yeah so the paradigm shift for me this year was the book tours are wonderful because you get to meet so many amazing people along the way and two of the folks that i bumped into you know with a little bit of planning were dr michelle perro and then also dr vincent adams who wrote a book that came out at about the same time I did. It also came out by way of Chelsea Green. Uh And it's What's Making Our Children Sick. And Michelle is a pediatrician of now 38 years, and she's been watching the chronic illnesses just magnify in her practice and trying to figure out, first of all, what the sources are, but then also, obviously, what to do about it and how to help these kids, infants in some cases, heal and in some cases even just survive. I mean, it was that dire in many cases. So she has it's really been looking at the gut biome and what's going on there and in what ways pesticides and other toxins are creating these issues in our society and just highly recommend it because it's a story of Michelle's practice and really of many of her patients that she's encountered and her thinking and she's come from what I think she essentially says is a very conventional medical background. Now she's doing integrative medicine and she uses the best of both worlds in ways that I think just give a real validity to what she's trying to tell you know, in terms of her own story and the story of these patients and how we've gone awry and where we need to go. Wow. Thank you for that. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? I like audacity. I think we need more audacity out there, but there's a wisdom that kind of goes with it. I think it would be probably to embrace the audacious vision while also embracing the humility and the wisdom of small incremental successes, because I think it's those small incremental and collaborative successes that get us to the audacious vision that we're all looking for in some form or fashion. Wow. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Philip. Thank you, Greg. Really appreciate the work you're doing and helping to share all these stories. Absolutely. So how can our listeners get a hold of you? So they can go through the Toppling Goliath page if they like. So www.topplinggoliath.org and they can email me that way or they can also find me by way of email, Ackerman Leist P. So my name all run together, A-C-K-E-R-M-A-N-L-E-I-S-T-P at gmail.com and love to hear from folks and hear what ideas they have and what's happening in their communities in this regard. Perfect. You can find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash toppling Goliath. We are your urban farming resource. You can find our podcasts on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. Also visit urbanfarm.org to find articles, podcasts, webinars, courses, and more. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. I have said it many times. I am a lifelong learner, and I'm excited to let you know about a unique global online event made just for those of us who want to grow our own food. In this four-day online learning opportunity, a collection of visionary growers, gardeners, permaculturists, and homesteaders share garden hacks, slow tools, gadgets, and gardening technologies. Join tens of thousands of budding growers and learn how to save time, energy, and money while doing what you love most, growing your own food and medicine. Visit urbanfarm.org forward slash garden hacked to register for this free online summit. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.